Hi, Charles. Good to see you today. Hi, Scott. So let me introduce Charles Sims, uh, who is the director of the Energy and Environment Program at the Howard Baker Center for Public Policy and also an associate professor, my colleague in the Department of Economics. Um, I'm Scott Gilpatrick. I'm the head of the Department of Economics. So I've, uh, I asked Charles to do this, um, this conversation with me today because he does research on a wide range of energy and natural and environment and natural resource issues, um, including infectious diseases. And he's been doing some research uh, specifically related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay. So you have a paper right now, a, a draft paper that you're working on that looks at um, sunk costs and what we talk about sunk cost hysteresis and when to reopen the economy. So this is basically a paper, it's, it's a pure theory paper, right? That's just using economic, dynamic economic modeling to address some of the questions around how long to keep an economy shut down in response to a pandemic. So can you kind of give an overview of how um, an economic model can address those questions and what the model tries to capture? Yeah, so <clears throat> in our paper is kind of one of many papers uh, that's out there right now. There's a whole number of teams that are basically trying to pair an epidemiological model with an economic model, right? And so that you have the epidemiological model that's that's spitting out kind of projections of how many susceptible individuals you'll have in a population and how many infected individuals. And those are the models that generate those kind of infection curves that you see in the news all the time, where there's some sort of, you know, gradual increase in the infect number of infected, and then it peaks and then it comes back down, right? And yes, we right. Like flattening the curve types of comments, right? Yeah. So we, we basically, and we're, we're, we're not the only ones, but this, this area of research basically takes those models and then tries to say, okay, well, there's some benefits and costs associated with susceptible people and infected in people in a population. And so the epidemiological models that, that kind of generate those curves basically then just provide an important input into our economic models. Uh, and then the economic models are basically uh, trying to weigh those trade-offs. So you have basically a benefit of any sort of policy uh, that is reducing the number of people that are killed uh, due to the disease. Right. Uh, and of course, the costs are, are kind of, a, 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 it can, they can be a number of things, but most of the costs that people have focused on have been what they call consumption losses. So this is really just the losses that come from people not buying things in the economy. Right. And so, that's generally from kind of shutting down businesses and having people stay at home, either either forcing them to stay at home because of some sort of mandated social distancing policy or just because they've voluntarily chosen to not go out and, and, and purchase and go to restaurants and things. Right. So as long as we're if we're shut down for a month then we can't go out to eat and we can't go to a movie or do other things. Right. There's a certain level of economic benefit, the consumption benefits of those activities that we can never get back. Right, that those those are just lost forever. We're less less well off for not having experienced that consumption during that period of time. Right. 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 And there's and there's a big there's a big discussion among economists. Economists like to think of these things as either what they call supply shocks or demand shocks. Right. And so right. demand shocks we would typically think of as things that kind of hit the economy and cause you and I and everyone else to spend less money. Yeah. Uh, and there's certainly some of that going on when we when we are asking people to stay at home and not spend as much. Uh, supply shocks are also the things that basically shut down production processes. So, so the, the outbreak and kind of the social distancing response have some elements of that. Uh, you've got businesses that are shut down. Uh, as a result, people are spending less money. And then those workers that are not working anymore have less money in their pockets. And so they're spending less as well. So there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things that are leading to these kind of uh, economic impacts. But more or less, it's all just less money flowing through the economy. Right. So mm -hmm. that's captured in the model as kind of uh, an, an ongoing cost of every day that the economy is shut down. But then there's also uh, a sunk cost that you that you model, which um, so talk about that and the role, the important role of sunk costs in a model like this. Yeah. So our I mean, a lot of the models that are in here, they they assume that the costs are what you what we would call variable costs. They right. only really depend on um, the number of people that are susceptible and infected in the economy, and they can be kind of ramped up and ramped down in some way. And what we're asserting is that there's essentially a fixed cost 
that comes with shutting down the economy. So you shut down the economy uh, or you, you kind of have this kind of social distancing put in place, these mandates put in place, and businesses are going to start to lay people off, furlough workers, shutter facilities, production processes just sort of stop, right? That's sort of the fixed cost that you have uh, that is going to be put in place no matter what. Right. And that's sort of associated with the, the events of shutting the economy down, right? Anytime you, you change sort of the state of the economy from being open for business to being shut down, which is a simplistic way to think about it, but that's what we do in models, right? Right. So it's either open or it's closed. And you're basically, the sunk cost is kind of capturing the cost of moving from open to closed. Right. Yeah. And then, the, and then of course, so it's, it's kind of the idea that imposing a social distancing mandate causes cost because everybody has to shut things down. Right. Keeping one in place also imposes cost because of all the reasons we just talked about. People aren't going to restaurants, they're not spending as much. So we were basically just kind of bringing up that point that there's both fixed and variable components to this. Right. And then the sunk cost really comes into the question about how much of this uh, loss is going to come back after you reopen the economy. Yeah. Um, and so if you, if, you know, if you say closing the economy is going to uh, decrease GDP in the U.S. by 20%, and then when you open the economy, that it's only going to come back and you're going to recoup 15% of that, then about 5% of that is essentially a sunk cost yeah. of imposing yeah. social distancing. It's something you never get back. Right. So once you've imposed it, you can never get that cost back uh, at that point. Yeah. And this and is kind of, it, this, these assumptions are kind of trying to bring into a, a formal mathematical model the reality that it's difficult, it's socially costly to move back and forth between states, right? That, right. that there's a big adjustment of shutting down. And then once, you know, as, as we're sort of experiencing, as you kind of reopen, then it's like, well, if we, have to, if we have to reverse course and go back to shutting down, we then may incur another cost, fixed cost of going back into the shutdown state. Right. And I, and I mean, we're, we're talking about the technical aspects of it, but I think everybody kind of intuitively gets it when you right. talk about how much we want to avoid having to do one of these mass shutdowns again, right? We right. all know really costly to do these things. Yeah, yeah. And then the other side of it um, is, uh, or another important feature of the model is the uncertainty, right? So you bring into this uncertainty in, in various dimensions. So talk about what uncertainty you're trying to capture in the model. Yeah, so <clears throat> these epidemiological models, they, they kind of have basically, a, there's, there's some rate of transmission that goes on in the model. Um, and that rate of transmission ha is really a function of two things. It's kind of just how infectious is this disease overall? And that's kind of a, a epidemiological question. And then there's this, a second factor, which is kind of the contact rates. Mm -hmm. and the contact rate is just a fancy way of saying how much people interact in a society, right? And so if you live in the middle of Wyoming, out in the middle of nowhere, your contact rate's pretty low. And if you're in New York, your contact rate's very high, right? You're bumping into people on the sure. subway all the time. Sure. So those, that contact rate is essentially the part that's, to, that's uncertain in our models. You don't know from day to day how much variation you're going to get in those contact rates. Uh, some days you could just have people on, a say, a Sunday where people are mostly staying at home and not mingling too much versus a Monday where people are getting on the subway and going to work. Contact rates are much higher. Um, it also gets at this idea of a super spreader. So you may have heard some people talking about super spreader events, right? And there's sure. one example of a, of a soccer match in Spain that is supposedly supposed to have been the, 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 uh, the big event that, that shifted uh, the, the outbreak from Spain and made Spain become a hot spot. And it was really just from a number of people from Italy going to Spain to go watch a soccer match, and they were all probably infected but didn't know it. Uh, and then they mingled inside this large stadium. So that's the kind of variation you get from day to day over the spread. It makes it hard to predict what's going to happen from day to day. Right, which just, yeah, just captures that reality that you, even if you know a lot about the nature of the disease and how it spread, and of course we're still learning about those things, but even when you do know a lot about that, there's this fundamental uncertainty about how the, the disease will spread uh, between people. It's never, it's never a, a fully predictable kind of process, whether you're open or closed. Right. So you, you, you bring those aspects into the model and let's talk a little bit about the benefits of the shutdown in the model. 
this. So, so part of what the model is, is capturing is the benefit of being shut down is that is the, the bending the curve notion that we are better off if we keep the rate of infection low enough that the medical system isn't overwhelmed, right? So how, is, how does that show up on a, on a model like you use? So in the model we have, we have kind of a, an assumption that's built in there, and we don't really know what this is, but there's some threshold level of infection where the medical system just becomes overwhelmed and you start to see a, an increase in deaths just because we don't have beds, we don't have ventilators and things like this. Right. Um, the goal of any of these policies is essentially to try to not cross that threshold um, because deaths obviously ramp up because much more costly. So a lot of the models are basically saying, okay, we wanna stay somewhere below that threshold. Uh, staying too far below the threshold is obviously costly because you have to impose a more costly policy. Um, and then really the kind of interesting thing about the unpredictability is that there's some sort of uh, cushion that you wanna keep a bit between you and that medical system threshold because you don't know from day to day what's gonna happen. Right. So exactly. if, if you ignored that uncertainty, right, you would just walk sort of right up to that medical system threshold and you could just kind of hover right below that. But with, with these super spreader events, you're unable to do that, right? You're going to get infections that kind of pop up and you're going to get unpredictable events that kind of push you over that threshold. So there's some cushion that you kind of want to stay below that threshold to some extent. And so that, that kind of shapes the, uh, the benefit cost calculus of kind of determining where you want to be between no infections and right below that threshold. Yeah, it's interesting, right? It, it's it's kind of abstract, but I think, yeah, well, I'm an economic modeler, so I find these things very interesting and other people might too, right? If you if you had no uncertainty and no fixed costs of sort of the transition, right, you would basically, as you say, walk up to that threshold, right? And then you would shut down maybe very briefly to get back under it when you needed to, and then let things go back up to that threshold because it's really staying below that threshold that you're that's providing benefits in terms of lives saved in this model right it's not yeah. that it's not that you are the way you're modeling it it's not that you are basically buying time to create a vaccine or something like that that's not in the model it's no. re it's really about staying within the medical system capacity and all the lives that are saved by not overwhelming the system in that way and of course right. as those other things, getting to a vaccine, are very important in real life. But in a model like this, it's just capturing that aspect of it, that even if ultimately the infection will spread very widely, how many lives are lost depends a lot on that, that dynamic path of how we get there and staying under the medical system capacity limit. Right. I mean, if you so a lot of these other models that don't include this uncertainty and don't include these fixed costs, their their prescription is basically to not do anything until you get right up to that medical system threshold. Yeah. And then you just impose the the most uh, restrictive social distancing policy you can. Basically, you just lock everyone in a room by themselves. Yeah. And yeah. drive that drive the infection down so that you can immediately sh basically shave off the top of the infection curve. This is kind of what we've started calling it. There's yeah. Flattening they're basically just taking the top and shaving it off. Yeah. Um, and then they just slowly start ramping things down as, as it falls. And, and what we're basically saying is, well, that's not going to be the best policy if you can't predict what's going to happen because, like you said, you don't want to walk right up to the threshold. But too, if you have fixed costs, you can't just kind of keep fine-tuning the policy. And, right. and we don't really see that anyway, right? We don't see right. Governor Lee calling up every day and saying, okay, we've tweaked the policy a little bit today, and it's a little less aggressive than it was yesterday because we recognize that, that those things are costly to, to adjust on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, right. So with all of those sort of features in the model, you, you end up with this, this story that because of the combination of the fixed and sunk costs and uncertainty, that there's, there's um, I like the term they use, there's this, which I know is, comes from this literature, there's this window of inaction, which suggests that you know, there's a there's a, a sort of state of the infection where if you've already shut down, you want to stay shut down. But if you haven't yet shut down, you you wouldn't, right? So you go th so that it suggests that we that you know once we once we do shut down, we maybe stay. It's optimal to stay shut down longer than it than it might appear if we weren't considering some of these factors, right? Right. 
So you, you, you're basically going to get and, and at some point in the infection process of the infection where you're going to come to a conclusion that uh, it doesn't make sense for us to do this, but that in and of itself isn't a justification for reopening the economy. And I think that's probably the major take home message for policymakers is it sort of sounds like you're, you're, you're kind of uh, Sunday morning quarterbacking here a bit, but it, it's basically saying that if you've, uh, if, if you've reached this point where you've decided that, that, that we shouldn't have done this to begin with, that in and of itself shouldn't be your justification for opening. There's a longer window that we estimate to be somewhere in the range of 30 days or so that you still need to keep this thing uh, in, in place, even though you wouldn't necessarily start one at that point. Right, because you've already shut the economy down at that point. And in some sense, keeping it shut down longer is insurance against a possible future required shutdown. Or even if, it's, even if it were a scenario where you knew there was never going to be a vaccine, and once you reopened, eventually you'd get back to that threshold, but it still puts it off longer. So you buy yourself a longer period of the economy being open in the future by staying shut down a little bit longer now. Right. Right. Yeah, insurance is a good way of putting it. Right. I mean, we all want to reopen as quickly as we can. Um, but then that question is, how bad do things get if we do reopen? And then would we have to impose these again? And so, yeah, the 30 days you can think of is just saying this is the, the, the insurance we need to make sure that we are to at least lower the likelihood that we're going to have to do all this again at some point. Right. And and then the the more uncertainty we have about these things, about the spread of the infection and so on, the the more important that story becomes, right? The more the more uncertainty, the more you want to buy insurance, right? Right. Yeah. You, yeah the, the bigger that becomes, the more the, the larger that that insurance policy becomes as well. So we're we're now in the process of going through. I think the the paper that we had, we we started early on in the. Uh, in the outbreak when we were really just trying to get some results and kind of get a feel for how big this effect was. And we, we've, we've got the feeling that it's pretty big. And so now we're sort of, we're in the process of going back and trying to estimate how large that cushion or how large that insurance policy should be by county. Um, because essentially those contact rates and the uncertainty in those contact rates vary from New York to Wyoming to Arizona. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, there'll be some places where that uncertainty is not terribly large, and you don't need a gigantic cushion, and you can basically reopen much much more quickly. Um, but there's going to be other places where you know you've got Madison Square Garden, and so if you reopen and you have a lot of people congregating in Madison Square Garden, that right. that could be a bad thing. So it, it, there's there'll be some interesting differences in the uncertainty across counties that we're already starting to see that will that will make this bigger or larger depending on where you live. And, that, and of course, that brings up the fact that, you know, there are, there are degrees of shutdown, right? You can, you can allow some businesses to go back, but limit the maximum size of event spaces and capacities and things like that. So start having some restaurants open, but not reopen Madison Square Garden, obviously, and things like that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where we're obviously going to end up going, right? I mean, right. I don't think anybody's going to say we need to do these mass shutdowns again, but I think the benefit of what this this approach will 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 be able to do is we'll be able to say essentially you can you can basically shut down all of the places that have lots of people in them, mm -hmm. uh, and here's what that would get you versus the blanket shutdowns that we've done in the past. So like you said, going through and shutting down Madison Square Garden, shutting down restaurants versus just blanket blanket uh, shutdowns for for everything. And that's a good segue into another topic that I know you're thinking about, which is the the sort of federalism question, a question that at what level should decisions be made? You know, you can think of federal, state, local, and so on, or even more micro than that, within the community, do you give um, discretion to individual businesses to make judgments about whether to shut down? Um, and, and there's a, you know, I think on the one hand, there's a, there's a lot of inclination, and you often hear the argument that these decisions should be made as locally as possible, because conditions in Knoxville, Tennessee are very different than even Nashville, let alone New York City, right? So that that argument for making the decisions locally, I think, is is pretty clear. But what is the what is the other side of the, that argument? So talk about the reasons why there there is sometimes a need, a, a benefit of having decisions be made at a higher level, state or, or federally, even if that means imposing a one size fits all um, policy across 
different localities that are having very different experiences. Right. So I think there's two main benefits of having things kind of be more centralized. I think one is you, you get coordination and, and in, a, in a, just a general sense, coordination across uh, the allocation of medical system resources, coordination and the timing of different events, uh, having one entity kind of, um, be at the center of all of this helps with that coordination problem that we've heard come up from time to time about uh, uh, lack of medical resources not getting shipped to where they need to be, right? Right. Um, right. The other big one is, is more of just movement across state lines. Um, and so when you have basically a state that's, that's kind of going it alone and making their own decisions, they're probably not paying so much attention to what's going on in neighboring states. Um, where they're, pers they're certainly not considering the effect of their policies on neighboring states all that much. Right. Uh, so you get these issues where, where basically po policies are paying less attention to kind of the flow and the movement of people across state lines. Yeah. Um, so yeah. A, a, a centralized government would sort of kind of basically ignore all the state boundaries and sort of just pay attention to uh, the total infected population within the country, which has some benefits as well. Right. Um, right. Well, it's interesting too. I, I, if you think about it in terms of your the model that we were just talking about, right? So if you have if you have states that are you know that are are making these decisions independently of each other, but they're bordering each other, and each state is having to go through this process potentially multiple times of deciding that it's now necessary to shut down, going through a period of shutdown or quarantine and then reopening. But if you have two neighboring states and they're not coordinating that policy, they're not, that, that policy isn't being done jointly, then every time a state shuts down, it's still being exposed to spillover from the neighboring state. And, um, and that's, you know, it seems like that might make, make even the ability to, to pursue that kind of policy of shutdowns when necessary more problematic because you're not internalizing those those costs you're imposing when you're open on the other state, which is trying to to lock down and and knock down the disease. Right, right. I mean, that's that's the idea is that that once people leave your state, then you as a governor don't care that much about them anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so then once if if they are leaving, then you may not pay any attention to what their infection and them spreading it to other states really does. And so you're kind of missing those impacts of the. Yeah, it's a classic. Issue classic externality kind of problem, right? Right, right. And so the, the real question has kind of been, does the, does the benefits of being able to tailor state-specific policies outweigh that externality effect? Yeah. And that's sort of what we're trying to tease out. And we're, we're, we're playing this sort of not fair comparison by saying you have to do everything at the federal level or you have to do everything at the state level. I think in reality, right, is you're going to find that there's some aspects of uh, the management of an epidemic that you want to go on at the state level. And then there's some things that you want to go on at the federal level. Right. Um, but by playing this kind of either or game, we're sort of just trying to provide a, a, an indication about which one of those things you might want to lump into state responsibility versus federal responsibility. And it is interesting. I mean, that's one thing that's clearly true is that different states are very out of sync with each other in this process right now, right? That the Northeast is, just getting to a point where the, the pandemic has abated enough that they're starting to reopen in New York City and Boston and places like that, just as Florida and Arizona are spiking in the infection rate. And you know we may be facing the prospect of, now, of having to reimpose greater restrictions in the near future. So it's, there's, there clearly is this, this out of sync aspect of what's going on in states right now. Right. Um, and I think there's probably some benefit. I mean, you, you, there's been some effort to kind of coordinate things by creating these regional yeah. task force, right? So New York is part of a regional task force, but, but who's part of that regional task force is basically just, it's, it's a geographic question, right? It's just the idea that you should be in the task force if you're, if you're my neighbor. Yeah. Um, but what we've kind of found, especially with, with like New York is looking at cell phone data is there's very little movement of people between New York and Vermont. Um, there's lots of movement between New York and Florida. <laughs> yeah, and California. Yeah. And California. So, yeah. so it's questionable whether, you know, Vermont should be involved with New York and New York should maybe think of a, a, some sort of a 
regional cooperative with other states as well. So that was sort of also trying to figure out if you were going to create a regional reopening group, yeah. who should be in that group, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. One other aspect of all this modeling that I want to come to uh, is as we, if when we when we look at these questions in economics about the trade-offs between um, you know economic impacts and saving lives in whatever context it might be, um, we often rely on this concept this concept of the value of a statistical life, um, and I know that's become a hot topic lately. So. Um, explain a little bit about what's meant by a value of the value of a statistical life, how that's calculated in different ways, and why the the current pandemic is sort of reopening some discussions about how to think about that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is really the gorilla in the room here. I mean, it's it's all of these models that we've seen out, come out so far that have tried to do any economics. Um, they've tried to put a dollar value on the lives that have been saved through some sort of policy. Right. And in almost every instance, they've taken this value of statistical life and they're, they're essentially just multiplying that number by the number of cases that you would avoid through some sort of, or deaths you, you would avoid through some sort of policy. Yeah. Um, and that value of statistical life is, is really just how much people are willing to pay to reduce the probability of, 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 um, of, of some sort of uh, negative in, negative health impact to you. Yeah. So in, in many cases, you could think of this as just a trade-off between wealth and your probability of surviving until the next right. period, right? So we think about um, this in things like the labor market, where people um, in making decisions about what jobs to take might face alternatives between different jobs with different wages or salaries, but also different levels of of health risk or exposure to a chance of a workplace accident or something like that. And we, yeah. so some studies try to estimate the value of a statistical life by looking at the decisions that people make in the workplace. How much more do you have to pay me to get me to accept an increased probability of, of an accident on the job that kills me? And so this comes up in lots of different contexts, right? And there are different ways of getting at this. And the numbers we get are, are tend to be quite large, right? in terms of how we, how we value a life lost, right? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 these numbers are used a lot by the EPA. So, I think, you know, like 80 to 90% of all environmental policies, the benefit is really not saving animals or something. It's really health impacts, right? It's saving right. the number of deaths due to asthma or the number of deaths due to lung cancer, right? So that number is used a lot of the EPA. It's used a lot in the Department of Transportation to figure out, you know, if we put in these new uh aspects of a highway how many lives are we going to save or what's the value or what's the value of uh um saving lives through imposing seatbelt laws or or airbags or things like that right right, um, right. and the numbers that they get are usually right around 10 million dollars per life saved yeah which is pretty big right yeah i mean to give people it's sometimes hard to think about that right that's that's many times the present value of the lifetime earnings of a median income American, right? So right. It's, it's a big number relative to what a typical individual earns over their entire lifetime. Yeah, I think if you take the VSL and you multiply it by the entire population of the US, I mean, you get some ridiculous number, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's way bigger than the actual GDP that we produce right. in the country. So, Right. There's some sort of there's some sort of internal inconsistency with it, but it, it the 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 inconsistency is really just coming from the fact that typically we're using this to value what are essentially small changes in probabilities. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's we're typically looking at we're going to reduce the likelihood that you're going to die by you know 0 0.001 percent. Yeah. Um, which is works, which it, it, that's kind of what it's designed for, right? It's really designed for kind of looking at small changes. Part of what has given people cause for applying it to the current outbreak is that we're really talking about large changes in probabilities of death. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you, the, the argument has, you know, you could have applied this if you were trying to figure out the benefits of preventing an epidemic when you didn't know that the epidemic was going to happen yet, right? So you could have used this to five years ago before the epidemic had occurred. But using it now that the epidemic is in place is not quite right because you're implying a much larger change in the probability. Yeah. Um, and the larger change in the probability, the implication of that is that effectively they think that this value of statistical life should be a bit smaller. 
um, and they're putting it, 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 it varies about what it is, but it, 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 the numbers I've seen that people have used have ranged from $4 million per life save to 10 or 11 million. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of where everybody at this point is trying to debate. And it makes a big difference. Obviously at 11 million, it's easy to justify a lot of different policies because the, yeah. benefits, yeah. the benefits of any policy is gigantic. So it's easy to justify them. At yeah. 4 million, it becomes a little more problematic. Certain things, kind of look good from an economic test and certain things don't look as good. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. And you know, and it, when, when you start thinking about these in real world situations, you get into all these, you know, difficult questions, um, you know, in the present outbreak, right, one of the things that constantly comes up, right. Is that it doesn't impact people randomly, right? Young people are much lower risk than older people should that matter in how we think about this, right? It, it, which is a, a grim question, but not without some basis, is the value of a life lost when the expected life lost is at age 65 different than if the expected life lost is at age 30. It's, it's, and those are, those are difficult questions to put into this context. So yeah, me, those, are, those are hard ones. So let me, let me finish by... Um, asking just sort of a very generally with the work that you do on this do you anything in particular that um it leads you to think that might be a different perspective than most people have as you see the policies that, that and how this is evolving currently so we've you know this is this is interesting right we we went through a period of shutdown and you know whereas many of the many other developed countries in the world were able to get the pandemic down to a very low level and now seem to be keeping it cont uh, well contained with a testing and tracing regime. We're in a different place. We came out of our shutdown while the uh, infection was still spreading quite widely. And now it does, the infection rate seems to be growing rather than declining. Any, any thoughts about what, how, what that may mean for the future or what, um, what the, you know, what, what research suggests policy should be as we look forward. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty um, pretty obvious that any new policies that are be coming down the pike would be m much more tailored to uh, either specific segments of the population or specific segments of the economy. So you hear much more talk of saying, we're going to uh, have at-risk people stay at home, but we're gonna have others mingle. And the other, the, the obvious problem with that, of course, is that, that those others, the, the ones that are mingling, are, are often interacting with the more sensitive people in the population, right? So it's, it's, it's hard to say that that's as effective, um, but it does kind of get at the fact that, that there is some disproportionate impact and disproportionate probability of, of death from a 65 year old person to a 25 year old person. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now there's, there's now we're starting to see growing instances where the disease seems to be spreading more often in, in younger people, especially in the Southeast. Um, and it's hard to kind of, we're still trying to figure out how much of that is driven by increases in testing prevalence and things like that. But I, I think moving forward, you're going to see policies that are much more tailored to specific things. Right. And I think we've, hopefully we've, we've bought ourselves a little bit of time to gather some information and figure out, okay, we know every, there's certain people who are more at risk. We, do we know enough now to define who those are? Uh, and then we know there are certain places that are extra risky. And do we know enough to know what those are? And can we just shut those down without shutting down everything else? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, moving forward, that's going to be sort of where we are. I don't think, I don't think anyone has any appetite for a full shutdown anymore. And I think we've all kind of recognized that um, kind of relying on everyone to voluntarily show social distance is, is not working in many states already where, where you basically still have a number of recommendations in place, but they're not being followed very well. So, um, yeah, but where does that leave us, right? That, that leaves us in a tough place, right? If there's no, if it's hard to contemplate another, something like a complete shutdown, even at the state level, um, but we're not very good about implementing partial shutdowns or localized shutdowns does that does that mean that we're basically just trying to stay below the medical system threshold until a vaccine can be developed 
I think there's probably a lot of that. I think it's probably what's what can how much can we shut down to keep this thing manageable and keep it under that medical system threshold until the vaccine comes into play at some point. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably some instance. I mean, the, the big question I think that remains in a lot of these places, and I was talking to a friend of mine who's an epidemiologist the other day. The big the big question is how much um, immunity does having the disease get you? Uh -huh. um, because you can imagine that if you if you had the disease and it conveys you know three years worth of immunity, then we could easily reach a point in the next six to eight months where you develop herd immunity in many places. And herd but herd herd immunity is basically the idea that you've got more people that have had the disease than haven't, and it starts to drive down just yeah. because you see yeah. interactions. But if you don't have, if that immunity doesn't last very long, and there, nobody knows how long it lasts, if, if, if you can basically get the disease again after a month, um, then this is, this is sort of, we're in a kind of a, a Groundhog Day scenario where it's just going to keep being worse and worse, right? And you're, you're not going to see any sort of curtailing of the, uh, of the infection curve until the vaccine comes in. Yeah. So you hear people calling for one, well, let's just go out and have measles parties and put everyone together and, and we'll yeah. create this yeah. community and that'll fight it. Um, or we have a vaccine, one of those two things. And I think the, the, the vaccine is the obvious one that everyone's pointing to just because we don't know exactly how much immunity you get yeah. from having yeah. a disease. That's still a really big question. But the herd immunity story, right? So even assuming that once you've been infected and recovered, you're immune for for a long time to come, at least. Right? The the scary part of that is that the the herd immunity story isn't a terrible outcome if those infections are very heavily concentrated among the relatively young and otherwise at relatively low risk, right? Right. But if we get to herd immunity, which as you say, we're talking about, you know, a large share of the population infected, more than half. Well, if 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 that's not concentrated among the young, that's gonna entail an awfully large number of deaths among the old before we get, well, among the whole population, but concentrated among the relatively old before we get to that herd immunity. So that's that's a that's that's always struck me as a fairly bleak if that's the end game here is we get to herd immunity before we get a vaccine, unless we can really keep it concentrated among the young, that doesn't sound like a great end game. Yeah, and most, and most of the time when you hear people call for the herd immunity argument, they're doing it because they're making this, they're, they're, they're making the case that we can't protect the at-risk people anyway with social distancing, right? The social distancing we, is not tailored well enough to protect a 65-year-old versus a 25-year-old. Yeah. But as you say, herd immunity, uh, herd immunity effectively forces you to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't feel good that you're able to kind of focus the disease on, on younger people with social distancing, then I don't know why we would be able to focus it without social distancing either, right? So I, I think that's a, it is, it is sort of a, it is sort of a bleak argument. Uh, yeah. It, it yeah. sort of undermines yourself if you're making that argument, I think. Well, on that cheerful note, uh, maybe we should wrap up. Good to talk to you, Charles. Thanks for your, sharing your expertise. Anytime. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.